welcome to the Straw Hat Social Club. Uh, I'm Todd, the anime expert, which is a made-up title that means nothing. And I'm joined by the lovely and talented Becca. Hi. How are you doing? I'm doing much better. Now. That's good. Yes. So today, doing another side piece episode. Um, still going back to, you know, early anime series or movies that were influential for us when we were younger. So today I picked uh, Mermaid Scar, which was something that uh, definitely made a big impact on me when I was younger. It's like a horror anime that was uh, just very dark and I don't know. It, it's very unique. We'll get into it. Um, but this was something that was made by um, someone named Rumiko Takahashi, who also made Ranma and Half, Inuyasha, Yurisa Yatsura, like a, a lot of series that were big when I was younger that I was really into, my friends were really into. And this was a part of something called the Rumik World, which was like an adaptation of a lot of her different stories. This was specifically from something called the Mermaid Saga, which was like a bunch of different um, stories that were kind of, what's the word, like... Uh, if it's a lot of stories put together, I don't know why I always forget an that. Anthology? Anthology. It's almost like an anthology that centers around this character, Yuta, who is an immortal, who's been around for like 500 years. And th I think they're all like different stories. I haven't actually read it, um, but I think the idea is it's like different stories just following him and the whole mythology around the Mermaid Scar thing. Um, but I guess you hadn't really you weren't familiar with this. This is definitely like one of those things we were from different kind of eras of anime. Yeah. I, I had no, when you mentioned it, I had no idea what you were talking about. Yeah. So it's funny. Cause one of my friends reminded me of this cause I had kind of forgotten about it. And it was like, Oh, this is actually kind of perfect for Becca. It's like mermaids check <laughs> horror check. I, you're not wrong. Cause yeah. once you explained it, I was like, Oh, well this is perfect. Yeah, and I, I can remember when I was uh, much younger, like we'll get into a lot of the details when we, because for side piece, I guess we'll break it down again. We like to do, we talk about the art first, then we're going to talk about the story, and then we'll give our like final thoughts. So we'll get into a lot of this more in depth, but. Also, uh, I feel like that serves as a reminder for me. Yeah. <laughs> I, I definitely forgot how we go through these side pieces. Yeah. I, I mean, ADHD. I'm trying to, trying to create a little structure because uh, it just makes it easier to do this on the spot, you know, because we're both n not the most uh, social. I don't know how to put it. Uh, I mean, we're definitely both mostly introverted. Yeah. So, I mean, so, having the structure makes it easier yeah. to just keep us focused on this i guess which you know why two introverts decided to make a podcast i'm not well totally yeah sure. i mean the funny <laughs> thing is i think we're both introverted we're both probably on the spectrum we're both kind of yes. adhd yeah. so uh so the structure helps basically <laughs> but yeah what i was saying is when i was younger i remember you know i was already a fan of takahashi who is a, a woman uh, manga artist which is kind of rare and it was probably even more rare back then. Um, but I was a big fan of hers, really because of Ron and Half. And the thing about Mermaid Scar was, even back then, I was really in the horror. And Mermaid Scar, again, we'll, we'll get into it, but it's it has this very unique kind of vibe to it. It's very dark and has a lot of violence. It's very frightening. I, I remember it really having an impact, like thinking it was just scary as shit <laughs> when I was younger. But I guess, yeah, we'll get into it. And before we, before we do that, though, I just wanted to point out that th I thought it was interesting. This is actually one of Viz Video's uh, first domestic video releases alongside Ron Moe and Half. And Viz Video, they're huge now. Like, they've done a ton of stuff. Um, they're, they're one of the biggest, uh, I guess, publishers of, of anime in the United States. But Ron Moe and Half, I think, was the first, followed by Mermaid Scar, and we also watched Mermaid Forest, which we'll get into a little bit. Mermaid Forest technically takes place before this. Um, that was actually released by a completely different company. Um, but I these... 
I not to interrupt, but That's I will fine. say, watching Mermaid Scar first and then Mer- Mermaid Forest, I don't feel like it hindered the story. At I think all. it's the better viewing I order. I actually am glad we saw it in that order. Yeah, but it is interesting. I think this was really in the early days when anime was first starting to be released in America. A lot of you know testing the waters and figuring stuff out. That's why a lot of the stuff feels kind of clumsy now when you look back on it, especially considering that it's just such a massive genre now that so many people in America are into, and it was oh, just yeah. kind of a different world back then, uh, which also helped with making it feel kind of exciting because I, I got into horror initially because it felt like something I wasn't supposed to be seeing. You know, it was like really dark and and weird and yeah, exciting that's exactly how i got into horror is watching yeah. it in secret because you feel like you're not yes. supposed to watch it uh and i think i mean anime in general kind of felt like that because it was something that was like weird and unorthodox that i wasn't used to seeing so it's kind of exciting so combining the two where it's anime <laughs> and horror was uh <laughs> very exciting um but yeah and i also just wanted to point out that when i was looking into this apparently in 2003 they made the Mermaid Saga into a 13-episode series that yeah. is supposedly it sticks closer to the manga, but it has like the violence toned down a bit. So I thought that might be interesting to look into eventually. I have no idea if it's any good or not. Yeah. Yeah, why don't we just get right into the art segment? So I guess I wanted to start out by saying that um, as far as the art goes, I can definitely say back then, you know, my friends and I were trying to draw a lot of like anime style stuff. And I think that Takahashi's art style was definitely one of the early things that my friends and I were kind of imitating because it is like a very distinct style that. I think I think holds up and looks really cool. You mentioned liking the way that she drew news, noses. Yeah, I actually oh, I play with my art style a lot, but yeah. without getting into that, the way that she was drawing noses is something that a way that I've been drawing noses <clears throat> recently, just testing it out, and I found that really cool to like see in action. Yeah, there's like weird little things like that, and like the thick eyebrows, <laughs> and I don't know. There's there's something that I have always liked and it felt like really nostalgic just seeing that art again yeah and i noticed that all of her eyes that she draws for each character are very distinctive and expressive yeah too which i i think lends to the character art a lot yeah totally but it did stand out to me that there's like this vibe to it that that seems like a really cool vibe for horror for lack of a better term but it's basically it's like very bright and warm like and the music too you know adds to that but there is this weird sense of foreboding because you know that it's like it's a horror story so that's kind of lurking in the back of your mind during all that and there's also i noticed there's like all these dark shadows like around the edges and stuff even when it's like very bright it's just very unique yeah, I noticed that like she plays with light and mood a lot and yeah. and the way that she uses color theory is really interesting too. Mm-hmm. Like I was blown away by the the color palettes that she's using and the way that she uses negative space. It's Oh yeah, the yeah. the shot composition, well, if you can call it that for an anime, but yeah, it it seems very well thought out and the the color palette that you mentioned, it, it is like very bright and it feels like kind of neon and tropical. It's almost, it, it fits with like the mermaid kind of theme. Um, a lot of like sunset, you know, kind of palettes. Am I right on that? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think she, I would like to think that she pulls from life into, you know, these magical looking scenes, but you can see where she gets, you know, the the perfect dusk like coloring like when it was coming through the windows and then at night you really mm-hmm. get this sense of moonlight and be, things Harsh actually shadows. yeah things actually being lit by the moon instead yeah. of it just being nighttime yeah totally it is it is such a unique tone um, and I think that that's one of the things that holds up for me the most is just the tone um, feeling like very unique for horror. 
you know and even like like the music i mentioned it can be kind of like brighter and cheerier but it also felt like very melancholy a lot of violins and stuff which just helps with that that tone that that uh that it's setting and also you know we'll get into it with the story but there is like a big monster in it which of course as a kid i thought was super cool and the monster design is just awesome yeah i i was super impressed by her monster creature design yeah even though the eyes look like nipples they <laughs> well, they're like chameleon eyes yeah well you know? yeah and they're just like you but that's like a lend to how she designed it because you can see how gross and squishy they are but yet yeah. they're still functional like it's not gross for the sake of being gross like it's actually like thought out yeah it's it's really cool because it, it does look like just gross like it's got these bug eyes that are like don't even look like they're focusing on anything distinctly you know and it's like a lot of slobber and everything and yeah it's just super super creepy yeah i do i love the way she drew slobber too yeah. it's it's just a nice hint of that but also the hair on the creatures just looks like oh, an yeah. 80s metal band hair yeah it's cool that they, it. they keep the person's hair because yeah. people transform into these monsters and there are little details like that, like the hair that just makes it a little more like ugly and disturbing, but also makes it makes you remember that this was a person, mm -hmm. you know, originally. Um, and also in keeping with that, it's also very violent. You oh, know, lots of yeah. blood. Yeah. I was actually kind of surprised by how yeah. violent it was. Well, it's funny. You said that we did <laughs> an episode on Vampire Hunter D, which... Uh, we'll probably have to re-record. We we may we might release that one day. We'll see. Yeah. But the audio is really corrupted. That was originally supposed to be the first side piece, but yeah, yeah. we don't need to really go into it. But well, I'm but I just let them know. Of course, it, it yeah. exists. We're still working on it. But I just point out because I remember you mentioned in that you were surprised by how violent it was. Yeah. They're also titties in there there's titties yes, in this one there is titties in this one too and it's funny because i told you like that era like this is kind of par for the course you know is lots of blood random titties well uh, they're mermaids so yeah mermaid, i mean you gotta have mermaid titties you, your if you're titties are technically going to be out it's not like ariel where she has seashell bra like yeah it's not real this is a natural state of yeah. a mermaid but that was that was part of the era and i think it it fits super well with what we were saying about the tone how it's like so bright and nice but when it gets dark it gets very dark and yeah i just i love that about this but unless do you have something else to say about the artwork i don't think so in particularly i mean it was overly like overall it was stunning like everything yeah. was stunning i was impressed by the composition and just the overall tone of it. I mean, I, I was roped in immediately just from the art. Yeah. I do want to say also another thing I think is distinct for that era is that, you know, the animation is good, but when, like, the action starts, it's like the animation goes to a whole other level, and it's, like, very well animated, very smooth, um, which is, yeah, another thing that, like, that, that style from that era is something that I think is honestly missing from a lot of stuff nowadays but that was kind of something to expect back then is when they want to like really kick it in the gear the animation gets like really crazy yeah and i think another thing to mention is like when we're watching animes from this era they were usually hand painted because of the yeah. tools available and like i don't know if we got to mention that or not but it lends to the nostalgia just because you know the warmth from the you know, the paint passing through the light of the transparency, the yeah. transparency. So I think we mentioned that about the early One Piece stuff. Yeah, I couldn't remember what yeah. episode we talked about that in. Yep. So yeah, why don't we move over to the story? But the story, I mean, the basic gist of it is, like I said, these stories, they follow a character named Yuta, who is an immortal. He's been around for like 500 years. And the mythology they present, which is also just one of the coolest things, because a lot of good manga, I feel like, starts from this idea that you can kind of sum up in like a sentence or two, and then it just goes from there. And the sentence or two thing about uh, 
this mermaid saga is that in this world mermaids exist they're still treated as like fairy tales that like you know just kind of ex- exist like in this mysterious way that people aren't really aware of but the story goes if you eat the flesh from a mermaid that it'll grant you immortality which is exactly what happened to yuta the dark side to this and where the horror starts coming in is that they explain that when you eat the flesh it actually like rearranges your body composition and for most people it either kills you or it turns you into this like horrific monster and it's very rare that it actually gives you immortality and there's already there's an interesting element to that because it's like would you take that chance you know and there are definitely stories where you have characters who are kind of on their deathbed who are more willing to take that leap there are some dire consequences if it goes wrong i i thought this was it's cool that it's a story about people who are immortal but it feels like very grounded in reality they're not like these superheroes they're not like they don't have these special powers they're not even like super durable like they take the same amount of damage as normal people it's just that they heal and can come back to life but the fact that it is like just normal people who happen to have immortality and it it feels like it's this grounded story from those perspectives is i think part of the the tone and what sets it apart yeah i think that this was a really interesting way to frame the story because I mean, we start with them like on a train and I'm pretty sure that they're they're just looking for work. Yeah, I think it seems like they kind of travel around because Utah, he has a companion uh, who's named Mana, who is uh, which was something else I pointed out watching it. I think it's cool that, you know, it's it's a guy and a girl, but it's not a romantic story like they frame it as their like brother and sister. Right. That's and a they, relationship. Yeah. They have this like strong platonic love to protect each other and. You know, yeah. things like that. I like that. And that's a big part of the story is that he spent a lot of time trying to find other immortal people because it's got to be like a pretty lonely existence. So you can see how they like latch on to each other. Right. And I mean, when they do make friends with humans, you're basically just watching them grow old and die. Yeah. And it's horrible. Yeah, which is something that that a lot of like fiction that deals with or immortality goes into. But I do like, again the grounded nature of the story that they probably have to travel around because you can't stay in one spot for too long. People start to notice you're not really aging. So it does start with them on a train heading to a kind of construction job site where they can maybe set up a new life for a little bit. And they run into um, a boy named Masato on the train, like this young boy who's traveling by himself who says that he's going to meet his mom so they become kind of friends with him. Uh, what was your like initial impression of all these characters? I will say I, I literally already saw this little boy as innocent, and I was just like, yeah. is he? You know, like how sad? You know, like he's traveling by himself and he's just trying to see his mom. And I, I felt bad for him in the beginning, like yeah. right off. Like I felt bad for this little boy. But well, I can say without getting ahead of ourselves, it is cool that. This feels very much like this thriller that has like all these twists and turns and and everything. And I I really like so like I said we'll go into Mermaid Forest just a little bit at the end. Um, but Mermaid Forest is much more the the OVA specifically we watched. It's more of a backstory type thing that's like very heavy on lore and and like I said backstory. Whereas this is like a self contained story where if you go into it knowing nothing. It does a great job of doling out little bits of information. Like, you don't even know Yuta is immortal in the beginning. It kind of gets revealed later. And I, I actually think it's better to watch this first because I think it just works really well as the self-contained thing that, you know, if you know nothing about it going in, it's a lot of, like, twists and turns as you go. Yeah, like I said in the beginning, I highly recommend watching this first as someone who had never seen yes. either of them. I felt like I got much more out of the story watching Mermaid Scar first. I think it's a good idea. Watch this first, and then if you want to know more about the characters and the world, then you watch Mermaid Forest. Because I, I liked Mermaid Forest. This was my first time watching that. I'd, I'd seen Mermaid Scar a lot back in the day. I'd never seen the other one. And I, I really liked it, but it is a different kind of story in, in some ways. But they uh, so they make their way to the job site, um, 
there is that weird thing where uh, the he, the mom is like she already seems kind of weird. What were your initial impressions? Because she has this weird energy. I don't know if you remember. But um, she seems kind of like distant, not very it's like very cold, you know. Yeah, I I definitely picked up on that. I thought it was odd that she was so cold towards her own son. So yeah. I was like, okay, well, something something see there's something's wrong with her or something's wrong with him. Well, there's so. also that weird scene where you see her like laying dead seemingly on right. the floor and bleeding and he comes up and is like, "Mama," you know, and it yeah, like really I explain. actually like I felt so bad. I'm like, God, this kid has been on a train by himself just trying yeah. to see his mom, and he gets there and his mom's dead. And I'm just, I, I, I literally the story had me like guessing. Yeah, that's so much that's from the beginning. What I'm saying about being this like cool thriller, it really it's not very long. It's only like 45 minutes, but it it really keeps uh, the story moving and keeps you guessing about things. Um, it's just a really cool story. Then, like, yeah, after we see her seemingly dead, there is that scene where she is alive and she's, like, attacking him with a pair of scissors um, and has to wind up getting... The, the little boy gets saved by Utah. He, he comes in and intervenes. But I remember there's that shot where she, like, stabs down with the scissors and you see blood come out. And you were like, did she just kill that kid? <laughs> no, I was really <laughs> shocked. I was like... What the fuck is this story? Like, yeah. she just murdered her son in, like, broad daylight. Right. But, yeah, it's it's Yuta using yeah. his arm to block the scissor attack. Which, again, great composition, great storytelling. Like, Yeah. I did think it was weird that, um, you know, he intervenes after that, and then they kind of just leave. Yeah. <laughs> and he's I... like, man, I feel bad for that kid. It's like, she just tried to kill him, and he just <laughs> left him with her. That was a little weird. Yeah, I I remember like out loud saying like, "Why are they leaving?" <laughs> yeah, and he's kind of just like, "Oh man, I wish we could do something for him," <laughs> you know, as they're like walking away. Um, but there is that that interesting part where we, we pointed out that everyone in the in these stories seems to be like a huge gossip. I guess it's like part <laughs> of living in a little small town because. You start talking to someone and they're immediately like, oh, yeah, that person, like, given their whole life story. So <laughs> yeah, it's like not even just their life story. It's like they almost know what they've been up to every single day. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but they explain the story about how, you know, she used to be married to someone and they were, like, out on a yacht and it, like, explodes or something and, and it kills him. And she's, like, horribly burned, like, all over her body. And then mysteriously the next day she just walks out of the hospital looking totally normal and she gets kind of ostracized by the community for that obviously but it is interesting this is when Utah is like listening very intently because he seems to know something and that leads to him talking to her and revealing that he's immortal that he knows that she's immortal based on that and they get into um discussing all of that but there is also that interesting part where when he's talking to her, the the boy Masato comes up and like peeks in the room, and she gets really weird and is like, "Yeah, we'll talk about this later." <laughs> you know what I mean? So, did you did you pick up on anything from that? that I point? honestly no. And usually, I I like to think that I'm good at picking up on what's happening with a story because I studied a lot of like film theory and stuff when I was in college. Yeah. And this really took me by surprise at like almost every single like part of the movie. Yeah, it's it's very good storytelling. So after that is when they wind up going back to help him because uh, I guess they felt guilty about just leaving him with his murderous mother. <laughs> but that's when we get this reveal that uh, there is this monster. And to, to give a little more insight, so apparently there is a... Um, it's like a maid or... what's the, I can't think of the name. I think she's a nanny. Nanny. Yeah, so, yeah she's a nanny. Um, her name's Yuki. Seems very sweet, you know, and, and there's like a part where she gets engaged and showing off her little engagement ring. And we start to get this idea something else is going on. Because do you remember when the little boy hands her like this random little piece of meat and is like, hey, you should eat this. Yeah. And I remember specifically at this part, I think I was more concerned that like, why does a child have a piece of meat in his pocket? And it's so yeah. gross. We imagine this is kind of like, I guess it's a cultural thing because it's like a little piece of raw like fish meat right. that he hands to her. And she's like, oh, okay, nice. And it's like, I feel like 
in America, you'd be like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, I'm not going to eat a little bit of raw fish meat. Yeah, exactly. Because in America, not a lot of Americans eat raw meat. I mean, unless you're like, you know, an influencer that oh, yeah, yeah. eats <laughs> raw meat. But yeah, I mean, in in Japan, you know, I guess it's just like, oh, he has sashimi in his pocket. So, okay. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But it's still gross. Like, I don't yeah, know if I'd weird. accept that from a child. <laughs> But I think this is after they explain the uh, mermaid flesh. So, I mean, were you, like, thinking anything at this point? Because I can't remember when they start to reveal something's up with this little kid. I think the only reason I knew it was mermaid flesh was because it lo- it looked like it had little mermaid scales on it. <laughs> yeah. So that I didn't was realize like, they were like distinct from fish scales. You could look at those and go, ah, that's a mermaid. That's not a uh, I mean, you know, salmon. But if you have, like fish for sushi it doesn't usually have the scales on it i I think it was supposed to be a nod to like hey this is mermaid meat (laughs) yeah but yeah when they when yuta goes back to save the kid that's when we get the reveal of the big crazy looking monster that is attacking them and it it winds up slashing what's her name misa the mother and uh seemingly kills her and and yuta winds up getting into a fight and at this point they still think the kid's good because he gets you know, his his companion, Mana, to take the kid out of there to safety as he's fighting. And this is where, like, this is a cool fight scene because the, the animation goes really crazy here. It's very violent. Um, I remember there were, like, distinct things like uh, the way that he gets stabbed with the scissors and he pulls the scissors out and shoves it through his mouth and then, like, doubles back and stabs him in the top of the head. Yeah, that was very gnarly. Like, Yeah, it's pretty crazy. I, that was... A- really cool kill yeah speaking in horror terms like that was extremely interesting to see him punch through his head and then (laughs) stab him in the face is insane it's cool and yeah this this is when like the horror really ratchets up and it's it's a pretty scary scene but after he kills it he notices like the little ring that's like all bent out of shape and you realize that this was yuki the nanny that he fed the mermaid flesh to, and she turned into this monster. I totally miss this part. I know. I don't I know how. It to you later. Yeah, because like I don't know how I missed this, but like I think whenever she talked about being engaged, I completely missed that, and that's yeah. on me. Like I had no idea. It was brief. I mean, it's kind of blinking. You miss it, but it's interesting. Yeah, he notices that that's who it is. So I think he's starting to put the pieces together. Something's going on that like. He he knows all about this, so he knows that she ate the mermaid flesh. So then it's a question of, you know, where did she get it from? And I think it's after this that they cut to the kid who is, like, leading Mana away at this point and claiming that he knows where there's, like, poison to kill the monster or something, and she's kind of confused. And this leads up to the big reveal that the kid is the bad guy here. He's, he's the evil one because he, like puts her in like some room and, and tasers her you remember that it's yes so crazy. I, that was yeah i i this really threw me because i i guess i mean you should know in most horror movies the kid is usually the bad guy yeah but I mean, he was just so kid. innocent he was so yeah, innocent they, they do a good job that yeah. he does seem like really sweet and innocent but there is something kind of creepy like when you look back there's a lot of little creepy moments yeah, definitely yeah, or he's just kind of, like, staring, you know? <laughs> yeah, he, like, wraps her in barbed wire, which is, like, like a lot of the stuff with the kid. I What I liked about it is that he seems very cold and cruel. So the big reveal is he's immortal, obviously. Um, he's been around for, like, 800 years. So he's actually older than Yuta. And you can see that there is this kind of weird cruelty to everything he does, like, um when he wraps her in barbed wire the idea is you're immortal so you'll heal from it but it's gonna hurt like a bitch so it's a good way to incapacitate yeah that is so like devious yeah it's pretty it's pretty scary but he he goes back because he realizes so i guess we should explain the whole thing is you know since he's a child and this is another thing i thought was really interesting in the story is that he became immortal 800 years ago and it goes into the realities of what it would be like to be a child who's immortal because you can't really live on your own like there are a lot of things like physically you just can't really 
exist and take care of yourself it also draws a lot of attention because people be wondering like why is this kid just by himself you know what i mean so it turns into him having to f seek people out befriend them so that they'll take them in and take care of them and they mentioned he spent like a couple hundred years just going into the care of random people but then watching them get old and die and realizing like he can't just keep doing this so that leads to him somehow getting his hands on a surprising amount of mermaid flesh because it seems like he just has a lot of it that he yeah, keeps he doling does, out yeah he has a weird amount just on hand yeah he has like a whole stash i don't think they explain that because no. the the mom wa mentions that she's trying to find it because she needs to get it away from him you know but he has like a stash of this stuff somewhere i guess and he finds people that can be like mother figures he feeds it to them hopes they turn immortal if they do then they can take care of them for a while and the whole thing with uh uh misa is that it seems like it's starting to wear off like it very much is like this imperfect thing because even though she's immortal she's like bouncing back slower and slower and he realizes like uh, her time's almost up so he needs a replacement which is why he gave it to yuki and now that he has mana he's like oh well you're perfect you're already immortal so you can take over but he realizes that's never going to happen if yuta is still in the picture because she's always going to try to go for him he's always going to try to save her that's why he leaves to go and confront yuta and try to kill him so that leads to another super creepy scene which is when he confronts yuta and is like again using that weird ingenuity that cold you know calculated part of him that uh comes from i guess being alive for 800 years because remember he's like chasing him and then he runs in the like piano wire that's strewn across the hallway and tries to like take his head off that way yeah it is insane that that is how they'd have to die is be decapitated yeah. like that's horrible yeah and he's like he pulls out a, a pistol he's like that, shooting him that just <laughs> that shocked me so much i did not yeah. expect to see this little kid with a gun <laughs> He also has like a axe. These Chinese that cut his head off. It's like, it's like very a super scary. Axe. It's yeah. like bigger than he is. Yeah, it's it's super creepy, and he's like just completely cold the whole time. <laughs> um, but you can see this confrontation's interesting because even though he's a kid, Yuta like comes to that realization that like, wait, how many people have you fed this mermaid flesh to over the years like you have condemned so many people to death or worse you know becoming these monsters just so he can find caretakers so he is like this very evil figure but he's a little kid and that winds up holding you to back a little bit you know it's hard to, to know like you've got to kill this guy because he's evil and he is hurting so many people but he looks like a kid mm -hmm. you know and it, and it is sad when you think about it that this happened to him because this is the other, the other side of the coin in the series is that you know it sounds great to be immortal but it's it really is a curse you know because you can't really die unless you get your head cut off so you're just left existing you know forever yeah and it's very lonely obviously he has had to figure this out from being at a very young age which is also very sad so yeah. he doesn't even have the wisdom of becoming an adult fully you know like he's yeah. always consistently stuck in this childlike state well it's sad when you think because yuta's whole his his answer to this was to travel around and just try to find another immortal and it's you realize like this kid he could have been like a part of their group you know what i mean like if they had found each other sooner they could have been like these surrogate parents and taken care of them but at this point he, he's so twisted from living like this for so long it's like i don't think there's any coming back mm -hmm. you know what i mean um but yeah so yuta he winds up getting like very fucked up by this kid um and mana has to come and try to rescue him but even her like there's that moment this very emotional moment because she's kind of they never really explain what's what's going on with her because she seems kind of like out there mm -hmm. do you remember like um, yeah, it does seem like she has some mental things happening, but I don't know exactly what they were. Yeah, because they even mentioned, because she does cry at the end, and he mentions, like, oh, that's the first time you've ever cried. And she seemed, she has this weird, like, cold, detached view of it. Um, like, oh, I just felt really emotional, and then water came out of my eyes. Uh, I have 
a theory about that, but maybe when we get into it more. Okay. But she does get very emotional about the idea of losing Utah um, and kind of literally puts herself in the way and gets that ax in the back, like trying to defend him. Um, but then she winds up collapsing and, and the kid just burns the whole house down, like hoping to take them out. Yeah, but honestly, even before that, remember, she like rolled down the hill and oh, like yeah, yeah. landed in front of the when gas she's wrapped station. in the barbed yeah. wire. Yeah, and had to rely on some human helping her. Yeah. Um, but there is there is that cool moment when she's holding him in the fire and um, has her hand over his chest and you feel when mm-hmm. his heart starts beating again and she gets very emotional and gets him out of there. And the way it ends is with them. They have that weird chase where they're on a motorcycle chasing him in a car and he's got uh, he's got his, his mom, Misa, with him because I guess he realizes like, well, I'm going to have to depend on you for a little bit longer because this didn't work out. But as they're driving down the road, the car runs into a truck, flies off the cliff, and, like, burns up. And did the, does the kid, like, clearly die? I can't remember. I, I, I think can't it's implied. Remember. I think it's implied that he died, but probably at the same time, it could also <laughs> be implied that he is still alive. Because sure. what uh, Misa, she burned alive in a boat accident and still survived. Oh, that's and, true. you know, he's much older, probably much stronger at some point. So. Well, I wonder if they pop up again in, like, the other stories. Mm-hmm. I'd be interested in looking into that. But there is that nice little scene at the end where, you know, they're walking and it's when Mana cries and makes it clear she she never wants to be without him anymore. Like, they, there is, like, a bond there that I thought was really cool. Again, it's it's the fact that it's, like, platonic. I, I actually like that. Um, but it shows that, uh, you know, if you're immortal and you find another immortal who's, like, you know, passes the vibe check and is <laughs> yeah. a cool person, like, yeah, you're going to want to hang on to that person forever because the loneliness of being without them has to be insane. Yeah, I think... Coming back on that moment where she seems cold and, like, non-expressive about what had happened, Mm -hmm. I think she's trying to prove that she's strong and that she's still coming to grips with whatever this curse is on her. Yeah, I could see that. Yeah, I don't know. Um, Yeah. No, I could totally see that. And, yeah, it ends on that note. It ends on that note where he pulls the ring out from Yuki and throws it into the ocean. I thought that was like a nice way to end it, you know, almost uh, memorializing, you know, her tragic death. Yeah, I miss this too, because I still- I know, you saw him throw the <laughs> ring and we're just like, what is that? And it's like, oh my God, it's like this big ultimate like dramatic moment. And the whole like ending credits is the ring falling through yeah. the ocean. I could just imagine being like, okay. I, like, that's I don't know what how that I means. was. <laughs> I was like, I mean, it's beautiful. The animation yeah. was beautiful for it. But I'm like, a, for the life of me, I could not understand. I was like, what is going on here? And that's when you had to fill yeah, me in. Funny. It's only because I missed that one tiny detail. I know. And it just, yeah. It is blink and you miss it kind of thing because it is like a very tight story. I mean, like I said, it's only 45 minutes because um, this is an OVA. Are you familiar with OVAs? That was something I was going to no. explain to you. No, we'll, not at all. We'll probably go into it again during the One Piece episodes because it's relevant. But OVA stands for, for uh, Original Video Animation. Okay. And it's basically, this is kind of just an anime thing that you, you kind of have your TV series, you know, that are aired on television. You have your movies that are like big budget release in theaters. And OVAs are really straight to video. They're like straight to VHS, or I guess they still make them now, so they must be like straight to DVD or something. But their OVAs are are interesting because they tend to be in this weird in between zone where it's like not as short as a TV episode, not as long as a movie. Usually, it's around like forty five minutes an hour, and the budget is like higher than a TV series, but it's not as much as a movie. So it's it's a weird middle ground. Um, and that's what this is, OVA. And I think they probably do this for certain things where it's like they don't want to commit to a full TV series, but they want to, you know, animate something. And this is what you wind up with. But they're cool because they can be like these short, like one-off things like this. And I, I really, again, I, I like that it's like this interesting thriller that 
really sends you on this journey where if you go into it knowing nothing, the way it doles out the information has these twists and turns and these scares. I think it's like such a tight, it, it, I think it holds up super well, personally. And you liked it too? No, I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's great. And I did, I wanted to talk quickly about Mermaid Forest because we did decide to watch that afterwards. Mermaid Forest takes place before this. It definitely gives more backstory to Utah and shows him meeting Mana and everything. But it is a different kind of story. It feels more like a, like a period drama type thing. Yeah, I was going to say it clearly takes place in a different time period. Yeah. But it is like, it's more of a drama. I think there's more like thriller stuff toward the end. It does have like monsters and violence and it, it's stuff that seems to be like a staple for this. Um, and it also, I thought it was interesting that both of them have like a secret antagonist basically where uh, you have a character who seems like a good person and then at the end you realize like, oh, they're actually evil because mm-hmm. the kid in, in Mermaid Scar, but in mermaid forest the whole thing is there are these twin sisters one of them gets sick so the other one feeds her mermaid's blood to try and bring her back and she it seems like the mermaid's blood it curses her to to turn into a monster but it does it in this like slow way since it's not the actual flesh and the reveal at the end is that the sister gave her the mermaid's blood to test it out and see how she reacted to it. Which is just so sinister. Yeah, it's pretty pretty sinister. But since she starts turning into a monster, she realizes, well, this is my twin, so the same thing would probably happen to me if I ate the flesh. So it's, yeah, it's, it's very sinister. Because um, she basically cursed her sister to this horrible existence um, just because she was seeking immortality for herself. Yeah, she did a a really good job yet again writing this story just in a way yeah. where you wouldn't you wouldn't expect the twist, really. If you're not really yes. closely closely paying attention, you I mean even then you probably still wouldn't see it coming cuz I it surprised me. Yeah, and I I think it's cool that that seems to be like a staple here is that it's got these weird twists and turns and like the big twist at the end and everything like they they're very good stories like the storytelling style um and and again it has that same tone where it's like bright and colorful but it also feels like sinister and foreboding around the edges um so it's still very cool but mermaid scar i think is like that is the one that's the really tight good story that's like very self-contained and you don't need to go like super in depth with the lore and everything. Like you can pick up everything you need just from watching that one. So, do you have anything else you wanted to say about the story? Well, I mean, just as personal preference, I think I like Mermaid Scar more. I agree. Than Mermaid Forest. Not that Mermaid Forest was bad, but I will say some of the story was a little hard to follow in the beginning, but it all tied together I get that. in the end. I can understand that because I I knew what was going on from the get-go. So I guess as a new viewer, that makes sense. I can't remember how I felt. I remember back then just being like, I know there's a monster in this. Can't wait to see it. (laughs) You know, like I was pretty young. Probably too young, but I could say that about a lot of stuff I watched. Yeah, I mean, if we ever get into a horror podcast, we can go into all the stuff that we shouldn't have watched when we were kids. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's not super relevant, but (laughs) after this, we decided to watch... The Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, the <laughs> yeah. original live action movie. And we had a lot of the same thoughts. Like, I can't believe this was made for kids. Like, yeah. it, it gets pretty dark. Yeah, that story is just a little <laughs> too dark. Like, I can't believe I, I was probably five when I watched that, maybe. Like, oh, I thought that was great. Because it's yeah. like, you're not handling children with, like, kid gloves back then. You're no. you're going into more serious themes and stuff. And I wish, I guess there is still some of that nowadays. But yeah, I don't, I don't know if they trust kids as much these days. Yeah, the way that the the darkness of that movie seemed to be compartmentalized into my brain yeah. instead of me, like, actually picking up on it when I was a kid, because I definitely did not. I only remember, like, you know, them eating pizza and skateboarding. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay, well, why don't we just go into our final thoughts then? So, I mean... Overall, you know, I've, I've said it a bunch, but 
I do think this is the stronger of the two. If you're going to watch one, watch Mermaid Scar. And we watched it on YouTube because it's one of the things from that era is uh, this stuff, since, since it came out in the time when this wasn't as much of a massive popular hobby, you know, it was much more of a niche thing. Um, it's not as accessible nowadays. Like, because the same thing happened with Vampire Hunter D. We couldn't find that anywhere. Mm -hmm. And we just had to watch it on YouTube. Yeah. I think I even read that Mermaid Scar was never released um, in a subtitled format. It was dubbed only. Mm -hmm. So it's, you can see that it's it's a very different era. But, I mean, at the end of the day, the fact that it's on YouTube made, means that it's actually probably yeah. the most accessible, which is the funny thing. Because it's not exactly a legal upload, but it's there. There's other things like, uh, I don't know if I'd, I mentioned you, like Berserk. You know I'm a huge fan of that. Mm -hmm. The original anime from 97, I think you like can't get it anywhere. But it's on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so leave it to YouTube to, uh, what's the word? Collect the ad money from it? <laughs> I, I guess that's like <laughs> one way to look at it. But uh, Actually, I don't think we had any ads pop up in the middle of it. Because I don't have to. Oh, yeah. I don't have well, it's probably not anymore. monetized at all. Yeah, well, yeah, that's yeah. true too. But leave it to YouTube to archive, you know, stuff from our childhood that other companies might think are like not worth the money for server space or right. whatever. Like we definitely love watching those two thousands nineties commercials oh, stuff yeah. too, just for the nostalgia. Yeah, because I mean, it's funny because I I noticed on Prime, I was kind of going through to get ideas for stuff to watch for this and prime has a bunch of stuff from uh my childhood from like the saturday anime period that we can watch but um it's not perfect there still are things that fell through the cracks like this uh, i mean berserk again i don't even think you can like buy a dvd of the uh original series anymore like it's that just seems not weird like nobody's printing it you know it seems like a very popular anime they they also have like the newer uh versions of it and they're probably focusing on that and maybe they just think like there isn't enough money in you know printing the dvds and putting them in the store and well i think dvd sales right now are probably not the best yeah yeah definitely. in general but yeah this is from that that lost era but yeah it, it i think it held up clearly you said you liked it and again, I there was something that worked for me thinking about their setup, like the way they incorporate the supernatural stuff with the mermaids that just knowing that like these mermaids exist in the world and are being like hunted by people just for their flesh and nobody knows about it. I don't know how to put it in the words, but there was something about that that just it had this very dark fantasy vibe to it that really worked for me. I just think. The mythology around this stuff is like so immaculate, so well done. Because it also it also winds up feeling very grounded in reality, even with the immortality. Because it goes back to what I was saying about the regular people. It's not like the superhero type thing. Like if they get a little cut, you know, there's that thing where they wipe the blood away and the cut's gone, and that's like really cool. But if they get shot in the heart, it's like they just fall over and die, basically. Yeah, they have to wait to regenerate. Yeah. So. uh I thought that was that was really cool. They can't just like, you know, rush forward through all that damage. Like they take the damage. Like because you mentioned when he was shooting at him, you were like, "Why would you shoot him with a gun? That's not going to do anything." Mm -hmm. And then you see how he starts getting like all drowsy and mm -hmm. like as he's losing the blood and stuff. Like it it still hurts him. It still takes an effect on him. But yeah, very cool movie. Did you have any final thoughts about it? I guess like two final things mm -hmm. towards the end. It was. So sad to see a dying mermaid just hanging out in a cave. Like, that was... Oh, cause yeah, from Mermaid be, Forest. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, that was Mermaid Scar, I think. Because they had to go to the cave. With, oh, Mermaid wait, Forest. no, that was Mermaid yeah. Forest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a um, cool part, though. It, it was. It was interesting to see, like, you know, apparently, like, her grandfather had, like, harvested this mermaid and, like, kept it in the cave, which is yeah. horrifying. And I remember we had talked, like, during the movie, like, well, would you drink the blood? Would you... Oh, yeah. yeah you know, and, like... <laughs> I said, like, well, if it was, like, ethically sourced, like... If, <laughs> I don't think if that was wanted, ethically sourced. No, yeah. not at all. Not Of course, yeah. I didn't think we even got to that part when we were talking about it. But, you know, to think, like, you know, if a mermaid's donating 
life-saving blood, then obviously, but I'm not going to take it from them. But anyway, I also wanted to talk about how the older, well, they're twins, so they're technically the same, but the older looking sister, how she just like pitied or petty died. Like she died out of like petty (laughs) and she was like trying to get her revenge and she just fucking died. Just died. Yeah, (laughs) that's pretty messed up because when when the reveal that she's actually like the bad guy and uh, the the one sister's trying to force her to eat the mermaid flesh like as revenge (laughs) and she just (sighs) just died. It's like, are you fucking serious? Like, that's so crazy. Yeah, that was pretty funny. Yeah. Um, but also just a cool detail. It's, I, mean, I just thought it was funny. Yeah. It's, it's also like very sad. That, oh, yeah. Because she makes it clear she was going through this all this time just to get her revenge because she realized, you know, what happened. So it is sad that she's like never able to get that revenge. But it is a funny thing to just be like, well, fuck you. <laughs> and just <laughs> die before they can do it. Yeah. 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 Um, I just I had to mention that because that just yeah I forgot I about thought that. that was so funny yeah but yeah it holds up um it it honestly between this and Vampire Hunter D which we will hopefully get back to at some point this era for me is like uh this is like choice anime era because because it's like I said it's it's something about the the tone the art the way it incorporates like this extreme violence there's just something to that that still resonates with me and works so effectively and i just i love watching stuff from this era and it's it's not even just anime because you also look at like uh movies that came out like we said ninja turtles Mm -hmm. there's stuff like robocop that was like dark and very violent Mm -hmm. but this is what we watched as kids you know and even stuff like um dark crystal and Oh and god! Legends. If we ever anywhere ever talk about Dark Crystal, that gave me nightmares yeah. for all, years. All that, all that dark fantasy stuff from that era was definitely very uh, formative for me, and probably from for a lot of people from our era. You know, I'm actually really glad. I don't want to go off on a tangent mm-hmm. but that you brought up Dark Crystal because. I had nightmares of that fucking blue worm <laughs> for like years of my life, like well yeah. into from being a child up into like t- becoming a teenager. A lot of, a lot of nightmare stuff from <laughs> that. But, you know, I think that was exciting as a kid. Oh, yeah. To, to watch that stuff because it did feel almost like you're not supposed to be seeing this. Yeah, I definitely watched Dark Crystal like I was hiding on my, gr- on my grandparents' porch watching it yeah. on their TV in the back. Like, that was just, like, setting myself up for nightmares. But I didn't know what it was about. Yeah. I was probably, like, seven years old, and I'm like, all right, I'm going to watch this. Yeah, but this, I think anime reflected that era, too. I don't know what it was, if it was, like, all the lead paint that was fucking everybody up be. or something. But If you look at Nickelodeon and Cartoon Network, too, it's, yeah, just, yeah, it's true. the lead paint making these incredible, weird, dark shows and movies yeah but this this is my jam i love this stuff (laughs) so i'm excited to watch more stuff and i think it's funny because when we watch your stuff it's probably going to be like miyazaki (laughs) and like my stuff but it is it literally it's all going to be like bubbly bright things because that's just what i had access to and it's funny because we are only like five years apart but Mm -hmm. i feel like the the difference in in our eras like the stuff we were consuming there there is a difference you can see like where the transition happens a little bit but my stuff's going to be a little more a little more twisted (laughs) a little darker and weirder but i'm excited to go back to that stuff because the nostalgia is very strong for me it's it's weird because i don't really get nostalgic about a lot of stuff but this is something that really resonates with me personally so excited to get into more of these yeah i am too <clears throat> but yeah i think that was good i don't know if you had any other final thoughts or anything um no if we're done talking about the story do a little bit of housekeeping i guess sure we should probably start doing housekeeping at the beginning but yeah. uh, we'll get there that's all right i mean what did you want to talk about well i mean i think it's good to say like this is the first podcast that we are now actually officially launched. Oh, yeah. Like, we've been working on this project for a long time, and, like, we have finally launched the podcast officially. Yeah, we pre-recorded a lot of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so that's been fun. Mm-hmm. I don't know what else to say about that right now. I think we'll go more in-depth. I have an idea for an episode where we can really talk about Yeah, that. I don't... We don't have to 
get into all the other stuff, but I just thought it was nice to mark, at least at this episode, we have now officially launched. Yeah, it's the point. first one since yeah. then. Yeah. Um, but that also means you can find us on Instagram. Yes. We're posting on there now. <laughs> yes. Uh, should be on YouTube by the time you hear this. Yeah, we're, you know, we're working on YouTube right now, but. <laughs> yep. Trying to get our TikTok algorithm going, which is fun because uh you don't use I, tiktok i never and use tiktok it is so crazy to it's see so someone funny. in real time get addicted to TikTok. well i wouldn't i listen i wouldn't say i'm addicted i mean but sure it's not like i'm checking it every day but the the funny thing about it is <laughs> becca was because she's the big tiktok ma- master over here i don't know i wouldn't brain. call it a master <laughs> okay but a tiktok addict let's say okay that's yeah. fair uh but you were noticing you kept getting spoiled on One Piece stuff. So I was like, ah, I can I can scroll through and, you know, <laughs> try to like the One Piece stuff, get our algorithm straight. And, yeah, it's I, – I mean, I probably sound old as shit, but it is, like, a weird world. Like, I, I'm just not used to that. Um, damn, yeah, that really TikTok does make me sound its old own, as fuck. Yeah, TikTok has its own flavor <laughs> of memes. So I'm sure oh, yeah. you're starting I mean, to dip well, your toe into Well, a that. lot of that stuff makes its way to, like, Reddit and stuff where oh, I'm at. Well, yeah. But, you but, know, like months later. <laughs> but it is like, it's much more raw. It, it feels like I'm watching the source <laughs> material, you know? Like, it, it gets a little crazy. Yeah. Also, I can tell you've been scrolling on there because the amount of lives of like haunted, haunted houses and stuff. Okay, well, hold on. <laughs> no, I haven't. Like, what is this? I was barely on that algorithm for a, li- like, only a little already. bit. Yeah, but they, they probably know. connect my account. But anyway, yeah, I guess follow us on all those places. Is there yes. anything else I missed? I, I don't think so, you know. Instagram, YouTube, Tumblr. We have a, our links set up on every profile. So if you need to find us on another platform or if there's a preferred way you want to listen, it's up there. Sure. All right. So we can wrap it up. Oh, wait. Also, yes. if you have a movie or something, oh, I yeah. feel I like to tag this on the end, you know. Yeah. Because I, I really do like just want to hear other people's experiences with anime. I mean, especially in America. Yeah. I feel like there was a lot of stigma around it, and it's just, I'm interested to hear. Well, I'd love to hear it from people of all different generations. Oh, like of how course. They got into yeah, it. it's not, first of all, not exclusive to America. I'd love to hear in other places, too. Yeah, sure. But, you know, I'm just interested, and, you know, if you want to share a story, if you want to share a favorite movie that, you know, for us to watch and review, I'd love that, too. And you can send it to strawhatsocialclub at gmail.com. Yes. All right. Well, I'm Todd. I'm Becca. This has been Straw Hat Social Club, and catch us next week. Yes.